Well, good morning, everybody. I appreciate everybody who prayed. I asked you all to pray for snow. Hume Lake was muddy. And this week, they have at least a foot of snow. And uh, it was looking amazing. Uh, our trip, is, I know, praise, praise the Lord, our trip is going to be amazing. Um, so I appreciate that. If you have your Bibles today, you can open up to Job. We're going to be in Job 1 for a while. And um, if you want to follow along with us, we'll be in Job. Uh, but one of the most challenging questions that all of us have faced, and most of us have verbalized, and most of us have thought about, is to ask God, why? Why, God? Why am I going through this? Right? We talked about this with Parker a second ago. Why, why, why is my family going through this? And throughout the scriptures, there are a number of people. Hey, Cash, if you bring it down just a hair, I think it's ringing out. There's great people, people that we admire, people that we hold in high biblical esteem, people that uh, we ask, who have asked God why. And the biggest why, as far as humans are concerned, is probably Jesus on the cross. And he says, my God, my God, why? And we could probably spend an entire message on that. But the biggest why um, for humans and our own troubles is going to be Job. Job is the ideal man. Everything in his life written in the first five books of Job is what we would all love to live our lives. He was a blameless man. He was a man of complete integrity. He feared God he turned away from evil. He was not only a man of strong faith, but he had a really solid family. In verse 2, he had seven sons and three daughters. And most of what we most of all would love is wealth. He had a great fortune. But now in verse 6, his life is about to be turned upside down. As successful as he was, something begins to happen that collapses his world. Now he's going to become a man of suffering. So just because you have faith, just because you have a really solid family, just because you have some wealth, some extra money in the bank maybe, you don't have a foolproof plan to keep yourself out of trouble. So to understand what Job is going through, what we may go through or have been going through. Let's, deep, let's dive deeper into verse 6. One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth watching everything that's going on. So you have God calling a meeting with angels and demons and Satan is a part of this gathering. Daniel 9, 7, uh, 9 through 10 says it like this. I watched as, a, as thrones were put in place and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow his hair like the purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire. And a river of fire was pouring out. Flowing from his presence, millions of angels, got, uh, angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. The court began its session. And check this out. And the books were opened. So the gathering in Job, the court scene that is described is the same court scene that we're talking about in Daniel with thousands or millions of angels because court is called intercession. Your relationship with God on earth is a spiritual one, but behind the scenes is also a legislative one. It's a legal gathering. If you don't understand the legality of your life on earth, and what's happening behind the scenes, you're not going to fully realize what's going on. Satan and the angels are called to court. That's the reason they're there to gather. 
There's a grand jury in session. God asked Satan, where have you been? What are you doing today? Who are you messing with? Revelations 12, 7 says it like this, accuser of our brothers and sisters. The Greek word for accuser means to bring legal lawsuit. So Satan wants to bring legal lawsuit against you. And he wants to do it for one overriding purpose, to keep you from God. Daniel 7 says the books were open. Psalms 139 and 16 says that when God made you, he put you in a book. The book is the destiny of what your life could be. It says the story that God has written for you, the desire that he has for you, and the design for you is in this book. So you have a book. Satan's goal is for you not to realize what is written in that book. Another one, he wants to deny your destiny. He wants to deny God's plan and God's goals for your life. He wants to keep that book from being realized, keep your destiny. And he does that by accusing you. So he's been walking back and forth from earth looking for someone to accuse. And then God, he does something that we don't like. He did something I didn't like. I struggle with this. You may struggle with it. But he helps the devil out. Verse 8, have you considered my servant, Job? While you're walking around looking forward to somebody to mess with, why don't you check out Job? Maybe you feel like God's told the devil to check you out sometimes. Why don't you check out Job? Please notice that he says, my servant, Job. God tells somebody to check out God tells Satan to check out somebody that he never mentioned. Satan never bought up Job. He brought him up. Have you checked out? He's actually the goat. He's the greatest. Greatest of all time. There's no one like him on earth. Verse 8, he's blameless, upright, fearing God, turning from evil. So the big question is why? Why would God do this? Why would he help the devil out? God, if the devil can't find me, don't give him my home address, right? He does not need my email. Don't give him my cell phone, that's for sure. I already got weird people calling me. Satan said, Job, I, I know Job. In fact, he is the greatest man on earth. But does Job serve you for no reason? Check it out. In order for Satan... To accuse you, he has to have something to work with. Job's blameless in all his actions, but God, I think, I think I got something on him. Sometimes Job's motives are wrong. You know, he does the right thing, but he doesn't always do it for the right reason. So does he serve you for nothing? Or is he like a lot of folks who serve you for his Blessings. Go to church. I need to get some blessings from God. God, I, I'm going to pray to you all week because I really need a new car. I need a bigger house, new clothes, whatever it is. The devil says, I, I can challenge Job on his motives. I can't blame him for his actions. He either doesn't do anything wrong or when he does do something wrong, he atones for his sins. He sacrifices he repents. He's back in fellowship with you, God. But I think I can get into his mind. I can attack Job on the motivation level. But God, I got a problem. Uh, I got a big problem, actually. God, you brought up Job. I didn't bring him up. Verse 10 says, you have always put a wall of protection, a hedge, around him and his property and his home. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. He says, I've got a, a problem. You've put a restraining order on me. That's what a hedge is. The reason I haven't been able to get to Job is you're blocked. You blocked me. You surrounded him. You're protecting him. And that's the only reason I can't get to him. 
And if you ever let me loose, if you ever let me off my chain, if you want me to prove to you, take that restraining order off. And I think Job's motives is enough to charge him with sinning against you. And there's a whole lot going on there. One, Satan knows about that restraining order. Two, he can't do anything until God removes it. That means Satan has to go to get God's permission to do what he's going to do, to be the devil. He's got to ask God if it's okay to mess with you. If you remove that protective shield, I will prove to you he ain't the goat. He's not that great. 11, but reach out and take everything that he has, and he will surely curse your face. The only reason he's serving you is because you're giving him stuff, a good life. Take it away. He ain't going to be all that Christian after all. Today we live in a day where folks want to use God. God is good. God is good all the time, as long as my life's okay. God is good as long as I'm happy. God is good unless I'm not doing so well. Twelve. All right. You may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses. Don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. I'll let you mess with him, but I'm not going to let you touch him. So not only does God control what the devil does, he controls how much he allows the devil to do. But notice how much the devil is allowed to do. And it's connected with Job's relationship with God. Job is a blameless man. He's honorable, God-fearing. So if you don't fear God, if you don't really care about the Lord, what you've done is weaken your defense. Let the leash out further. Let Satan to do more to you. He says, okay, but don't touch him. And then comes the worst 24 hours of his life. Beginning in 13, he loses his kids. And a collapse of his business, 14 and 15, fire comes down and consumes everything. 16, a band of raiders come in and destroy everything. 17, everything collapses. And it's one thing to have a bad thing happen in a day. But to have everything happen in a single day, this is a massive collapse allowed by God. Understand me, the most important doctrine that you can learn as a Christian is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Faith alone in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, the gift of eternal life, accepting Christ as your personal Savior, this is the greatest truth you can learn. But the second greatest truth is the sovereignty of God, our God with unlimited power. Because if you don't leave, believe in a sovereign God, you live your life by luck. You live your life by chance or happenstance. And when life crushes in on you, you don't have, and you don't have a handle on the sovereignty of God, you will collapse. You will collapse at the work of the devil. When his whole world falls apart, verse 20, Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. Yeah. He worshiped, worshiped when he was hurting, worshiping, worshiping when his world has fallen apart. And don't get me wrong, this is not a joyful worship. Like, we had a joyful worship right now. He's still grieving. His head is shaved. His clothes are torn. He's falling to the ground. He's in emotional despair while worshiping. Did you know you can worship while you're in pain? What I'm trying to say is, when God allows the devil to do whatever he's going to do in your life, that's the time to draw closer to God. Not run from him, not skip out on church, but embrace him, embrace each other around you. Job says, in 121, he says, naked without possessions, I came into this world with nothing, and naked I will return. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Point number one, when you're falling apart, worship God. When you fall apart, say, God, I don't understand, and draw closer to him. In chapter two, it gets worse. Job, Job loses his health. Boils break out on his skin. His wife tells him to curse God and, get, and die. She says in verse 9, Do you stole, still hold to your integrity? Curse God and die. She's probably thinking, I've been trying to get rid, rid of him anyways, right? Curse God and die. Go away. But Job replied, You're talking foolish, woman. In, in 2.10, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything wrong? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. Then his friends show up and try to figure it out with him. And 23.3 says, if I only knew where to find God, I would go to his court. He's saying, I'm going through all this pain and I can't find God anywhere. 2310, but he knows where I am going, and when he tests me, I will come out as pure gold. He says, I, I can't find him. I can't find him anywhere, but I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm going to keep going. I'm not throwing in the towel. He says, the reason God is silent is I'm on trial. Earlier, he says, I want to take my seat. More courtroom analogies. This is when God is silent. I'm on trial. When you don't hear God, when you need God, and he doesn't answer your requests, you could be under the refining fire. When he goes silent on you and you're suffering, but you know that you're going to keep moving forward, you're going to keep your faith you're going to keep trusting God even though you don't see him? He says that you'll come forth pure as gold. And after everybody is talking, God finally speaks. God says, let me explain something to you, Job. Let me tell you who you're really dealing with. If you hold on to your worship... And hold on to the sovereignty of God in spite of the pains of life. You will get a bigger view of God. This little God you're coming to, the little God you're, you're putting your trust into, you're singing to at church, it's going to get expanded into the bigger, the sovereign God. Point number two, God will use trouble for you to get a bigger view of him. God will use difficulty to try to get you from stop being so churchy and recognize how glorious is and how you can trust him and how you can use him throughout the week. So we come to the last chapter, chapter 42. And Job has been listening. He's just in awe. His mind is blown. And Job answers the Lord, and after Job, his mind's been blown by God, he gives him, and God gives him no explanation. God doesn't lay it out. Let me tell you what's going on. Why it happened to you? Job is just understanding there's a bigger picture going on here. 42, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do everything and no one can stop you. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. He says, my view of God has changed. The thing that changed it was my trouble, brought on by the devil. Trouble that God allowed. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said. I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. 37 chapters, he and his friends have been talking. 
for 37 chapters. We were talking about stuff I didn't even know what I'm talking about. I'm talking garbage. I take it all back and I repent in ashes. You see, one of Job's biggest problems was he thought he knew more than he actually knew. And he had to have his knowledge of God expanded. God let the devil set it up for him. Scarily, lots of us need our views of God expanded. Isaiah 42, 25 says, state your case to God. More legal terminology. State your case, meaning repent of your sins and remove the devil's right to attack you. As we come to the conclusion, I think it's 42, 10, Job restores the fortune. I mean, God restores the fortunes of Job. But check it out. Not until after he prayed for his friends. Job needed help. That's 100%. His world was falling apart. His world was collapsing. But not until he prayed for his friends did the fortune change. So I want to say to you, minister, love others, even while you're hurting. Even while you're suffering, it makes a difference. The Lord increased all that Job had by twofold. Everything doubled. So as we close, you have a book. I got a book. We all have a book. The book says what your life could be. It says what your life could be like and what you should be doing. And uh, Satan wants to steal your destiny by distracting you from God. Trading your destiny by making other things your God. Making power your God, money your God, popularity, notoriety, whatever it is. He wants to trade. He wants to trade because it's going to make something in this world look more important, more potent, more profitable, so much better than God. The one-third of the angels who traded will be in hell forever. When you trade with the devil, it's going to cost you. Maybe for an eternity. Maybe for a huge portion of your life. Our goal is to make that portion so much smaller. But God has an appeal process. If you go to God in repentance, if you appeal your case before God, give your life to Christ, give your sins, your problems to him, he can reverse that decision and pick up, and you can pick up the next chapter in your book. Get your book out. Look at it. Ask God where you are in it. Are you trading for something? Are you following along? Figure out where you should be. And then move towards God and the way he's calling you to live. So that when you stand before the Lord, we all will one day, you hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father God, we just ask that you show us in our lives, how we can stop trading and how we can get closer to you. We ask that uh, you just be involved and we, we listen to you, Lord, and we can understand. Understand how we're supposed to minister to others. Understand that even though we're going through issues in our life, that you are sovereign. You are amazing. And we ask that you continue to bless us. But when we are hurting, help us to continue to worship. Continue to look to you no matter what's going on in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.